Hello, everybody. Anthony Crane with Pocket Coach, and I am coming at you today with one of the trickier topics, controversial even, um, relative estimation. So there's a whole group of people, hashtag uh, no story points, right? Hashtag, like they're like, it's a terrible idea, they think. Um, I happen to be a pro uh, for story points. I think they're great, but they can absolutely be misused. And so we're going to talk about that. So I only, in the first five minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a light agenda because I don't think I can cover this one in just five. So I'm going to open up with what is the purpose of story points, and then I'm going to talk to you about the misuse. And finally, I'll actually teach you how to do it. So if you already know how to do it, you might, you know, you can skip the ending of this. If you don't know how, then stick around for that part. Um, but the beginning, I think, is appropriate, even to those who have learned how to estimate to maybe share with other people who are struggling with hashtag no points movement, right? Um, okay, so first off, uh, that I struggled. Should I call it agile estimation or relative estimation? And in the end, I settled on relative estimation, um, also known as agile estimation. So problem. Human beings, we are not good at estimating time and cost. We're just bad at it. How much will that cost? How long will that take? It's just not something we're naturally good at. And we keep asking people to do this, which is really not fair. It causes a lot of stress and they're not right anyway. So maybe there's a better way. Okay. So what we are phenomenal at is this is bigger than that. That's the one thing humans are just, we were just born to do. This is bigger than that. Right. So the idea then is we're going to get away from asking for anything about time and anything about cost. We're still going to be able to calculate that stuff using back-end mathematics, but we'll never bother the team about it. And we'll never hold the team accountable to anything. Their only job is that this is bigger than that and to be great, be as great at that as they can be. And then the, the portfolio managers, the, the, the scrum masters, right? The RTEs, if you're doing safe, they're the ones who will use story point mathematics and use that for forecasting purposes and never, ever bother the teams other than if a team just doesn't estimate at all, that's the only agreement, right? Okay, so um, we're not good at this. We still need to be able to forecast and plan. So what's the compromise? Relative estimation. So here's the hypothesis. Agile estimation taps into our strengths, the ability to measure this is bigger than that, and ensuring workers never again have to talk about time or cost, right? What a wonderful nirvana world that is. Um, this is a six-week experiment. You probably want to pair to first year two weeks. It's pretty typical for a lot of my experiments here. Uh, typical outcomes. Decrease team stress, right? Like let's de-stress our teams any way we can. This will reduce stress and you will not lose any accuracy. And you'll maintain or improve estimation accuracy. So if we're gonna if we're gonna not stress them out and we don't get any worse, hey, that's already a win. And if we can get better, even better. Okay, so skill growth. What do you gotta do to execute this experiment? Um, one, you have estimated your product backlog using Fibonacci numbers. And I'll explain to you in the second half of why Fibonacci is used. Um, <laughs> and so I can say that there, you understand why we use Fibonacci and you're comfortable to estimate any new piece of work in moments using this scale. So literally in just no time at all, you're estimating new work. That's where we want to get to. Uh, and even we're not going to cover portfolio level estimation like Epic or initiative or project estimation. We can do that with relative estimation as well. So different set of skills, we'll cover that in a different video. Um, but even there, we want to eliminate bottom-up estimation where we're adding up all the pieces to get the estimate because that's too waterfall. You got to get too much work. We need top-down estimation that allows us to use patterns to estimate the future without having to go all the way down and all the way back up again. That uh, doesn't mean that the final say won't be by the teams. That's critical in estimation is the people doing the work gets to estimate. But we're going to teach some techniques that are top-down and techniques that are bottom-up. The top-down ones happen early. The bottom-up ones will happen later and will update or possibly even refute those earlier estimates, but not so much that they weren't worth doing. Okay, so um, that's the, the setup. So I have a deck here that I love using for this. It's got a lot of content. What is relative estimation? Something called fast estimation. We'll cover that in the next video. Um, three stage, and we don't need that here. We also have an appendix, released uh, predictability dashboards and new initiative. That's kind of like what I was talking about with the epics. We'll teach you how to do that kind of top down early quick estimation followed by a more refined detailed bottom-up estimation. Um, so that'll be taught in a different video. So uh, I'm down to 45 seconds. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and get into um, some of the, uh, what are these points for? Okay. So number one, they're to protect the team. And that's it. Like people who use it to punish a team, to, to criticize a team, that is not the point. The point is to protect the team from scope changes, from scope growth, from, un, from unfair amounts of work being asked. Story points will protect the team. And as a scrum master, we learn what's called story point mathematics to defend teams. We also use it to forecast the future. Those are the two real things that we're trying to get out of story points. Um, and so I'm going to close this first five minutes with this thought. Um, a lot of my 
peer coaches will advise scrum masters that if a product owner says, can you please also get this piece of work done? That the scrum master should turn around and say, okay, but then what are you going to pull out in order to accommodate this new idea, right? This is how we're protecting the team. Well, I'm going to go one better. I think that's not the right answer. This is what the right answer is. The scrum master should use story point mathematics to figure out how much has to come out. And then since the backlog is always prioritized, they go to the bottom. And when someone adds something, they say, okay, well, then this is what's coming out. Not what are you going to take out? This is what math tells me has to come out. If you want this to come in now, compare these two things. Which one do you want more? The one that I'm pulling out or the one that you're adding in? So when you show someone the two options, it's a much easier discussion for them to say, oh, you know what? Never mind. <laughs> Let's put that one in the next sprint, right? Or something. So story point mathematics. Don't just tell people they got to take something out. Tell them, use the math. Scrum masters, use the math. Also scrum masters, when your team comes back with an overly ambitious sprint. It's your job to use story point mathematics to say, hey guys, this is too much. Now you can't be command and control. You can't tell them you must take something out. That's not a good scrum master. You can, however, say this looks like a bad idea. <laughs> I think there's a lot of risk here. And then if they keep ignoring you and they keep failing little by little, they will start to listen to you. So you never get to tell them what to do as a scrum master, but you are allowed to point out risk. You are allowed to point out danger. And that's all you do. And then when they say, nope, we're still going to do it. You go, okay, how can I help? All right. So that's my first sort of five minute time box. I'm going to reset my timer here. So for the second five minutes, I'm going to get into what is relative estimation. It might take me two five minute blocks for a total of 15. Sorry, but this is a big topic. However, um, if you already know how to do estimation, then you can skip this part. If you're curious, keep on watching and we're going to learn how to do real relative estimation. Um, and in a separate video, I'll teach you fast estimation, which is, uh, which is five times faster than planning poker. Okay. So what is relative estimation um, instead of hours and dollars? And why do they use these wacky Fibonacci numbers? So if you look here, I have two houses, A and B, okay? And house, if I ask you which house is bigger, it's not a trick question, which house is bigger? You can tell me B, B is bigger. Look, it's bigger, I can see it. But if I ask you how much money would it take to build A or B, you, you don't know. And how long would it take? You don't know. But you do know that whatever it is, B will probably take longer and B will probably cost more, right? Unless there's a trick question here, which there's not. It's just simple. B is bigger, therefore it'll take more time, it'll cost more. This is what we want to leverage. We want to leverage our ability to say A is, B in this case is bigger than A. Now, why Fibonacci numbers? So, in Fibonacci, if you don't know already, it's you add two numbers to get the next. So one plus two is three, two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, and so on. Um, except for once they get to eight plus 13, it was 21. And people thought that sounds fake precise. So let's just round that to 20. I, I don't love that they did this. I would have rather just straight up math, but okay. And then they do 13 plus 20. Well, that's 33. We'll just call that 40. Now, what really bothers me is in all the decks, when you add 20 and 40, what do you get? 60, but none of the decks have it. They go straight from 40 to 100, which it just bothers me. Like it's round, <laughs> like keep it. So I like to use 60, but most of the decks don't. Anyway, the point is, oops, the point is that um, these numbers are getting further and further apart, the bigger they are. And that's on purpose. And so on the right here, I have another drawing. I have two skyscrapers, if you will, just like these houses. And notice over here, the little guy, the little girl, the little person, they can see the, the, the heights of these two houses pretty easily. But if you can see down here at the very bottom, there's a little tiny green dot. That's the person again. And they're now looking up at two skyscrapers. And one of these is 100 floors and the other one is 101 floors. From street level, could they look up and tell you which one was taller? No, it's too similar. It's too far away. But and so we can't we need to count that kind of work as about the same size. But in Fibonacci, there would be a 40 and a 100 or a 60 and a 100 if you use my scale. And so one of these was 60 stories and one of these was 100 stories. You could totally optically tell which one was taller. And yes, I did actually put 100 bricks in this one, and 101 bricks in that one. So <laughs> uh, it was fun. Anyway, so you get the point. They get further and further away because the at the bigger it gets, the more unknowns there are. But you can still say, well, at least it's not that much bigger. OK, so that's why Fibonacci. Now, what about dollars and hours? Ultimately, we need to predict those things. We're going to take this out of the team's concerns. We're going to use portfolio thinking. So you know how much a team costs. They have a, a rate that you pay that team of people. So after a few sprints, you know how much money they cost per sprint. You also know how many stories are doing per sprint, how many story points they're doing per sprint. And so now you can just do simple division, divide the cost of that team by the points they're producing. And that is the approximate cost per story point for that team. So if you want to forecast about how big something is, just ask them, hey, how big do you think this is in story points? Don't bother them about dollars. When they give you the answer, you can now use the ratio, the dollars to points ratio from their history 
and get a prediction without ever telling them about it. Don't even worry. It's just an estimate. Same thing with time. You know that they uh, take two weeks per sprint. So you know about how many minutes or hours there are per point. Again, if they estimate a big initiative, you could use that to estimate that whole initiative. Now, that's not the way we're going to do it because to estimate a whole initiative is waterfall. So in a later video, we'll teach you how to estimate initiatives such that you don't have to do that. And you'll still be able to get dollars and time without anybody worrying about dollars and time, <laughs> except for using history. Um, the ratio, by the way, is team specific. You could get an average ratio across the organization and try to use that. It just means a less accurate estimate, but it still would work. Um, but again, remember, no one's held to these. And do not normalize points. Do not tell people they have to have the same size points. That's idiotic. It goes against everything we're trying to do here. You may as well go back to hours and dollars. Furthermore, um, it's all going to normalize anyway, because the average story is between one and 13 points. And they have to be able to get multiple stories done in a sprint. So if you think about those two constraints, and if the sprints are two weeks, which most people use two weeks, that means they're all going to come out to the same size as well. Same thing happens at features. If you start using features and feature points and plan features per quarter, guess what? You're still going to do about one to 13 points per feature, and you have 13 weeks to get them done, and you have to get multiple done per quarter. So in the end, they will normalize out as well. So if you do take an average across company, it will be a little more inaccurate, but it's a reasonable way to estimate. Um, now, by the way, here at the bottom, teams are not told to meet these goals. These are not SLAs. They're a word I made up, an SLP, which I call a, uh, instead of a service level agreement, it's a service level pattern. It's just a pattern. They take about this much time, take about this much money. They're patterns I can use for forecasting, but under no circumstances are the teams held accountable to those points. The only thing they're supposed to do is get good at relative estimation. This is bigger than that and never failing to do that. So that's the basics of, uh, of relative estimation. So um, let me see what else we got here. Uh, so that was what is relative estimation. Uh, I'm going to reset my timer. So this is my final five minutes. I'm just kind of checking out. Let me start the timer here. Um, what else I had. So the purpose, protect the team. We covered that. What is relative estimation? We covered that. Um, I Maybe we'll go into an example. So let me go into an example of this a little bit. And then uh, the misuse. So the misuse, punishing teams, asking why the velocity is so low, asking why the velocity is so high. Um, comparing one team to another, all misuses. Um, and another one, if someone has a really high velocity and going, wow, that's a high velocity, that's actually not, that's an anti-pattern as well. We do not reward metrics. We do not reward high metrics or low metrics. That is never the right thing to do. We have a separate video I haven't made yet on how to, on why rewarding metrics is so damaging and what to do instead in order to drive the behaviors you're looking for. Um, so, uh, what we really want is stable velocities. We don't even need units. If like, we don't even have units over there, what we want is a stable velocity. Um, if the velocity is getting faster and faster, that could be helpful, right? If the if it's because they're doing something that drove that, drove that not because you know their point definition changed. Um, and then we want to see their say-do ratio. How much did they say they were going to do and how much did they actually do? Um, and we look for that to be 80%. If it goes um, to 90 to 100% or higher, the team should consider raising its velocity. Um, because it's too easy. We want them to be stretching a little bit always. So that 80 to 90%, that's the sweet spot for your say to ratio. 80% to 90% of what I said is what I did. And if you maintain that, that means the team is forever stretching and trying and doing their best to get there. If they're hitting 90, 100, 90, 100, it's time to increase the goal, right? Okay. And that's time for the team to increase the goal, not for some manager to do that on, against them. All right. So I'm going to get past the fast estimation stuff because um, we're not going to cover that here. All right, so here's a fun exercise. Um, the one I really like to do is with the animals and you have a bunch of animals and you gotta, you gotta estimate how much they're gonna weigh. I have a really fun exercise around that. Um, but uh, in this one here, they have a three bedroom house. Um, and so here's a project list, replace roof shingles, paint a family room, upgrade a kitchen, et cetera. And the goal would be, how do we estimate these, okay? So the actual technique for estimation goes like this. Um, so, oh, I guess I don't have that in here. Okay, I'll just tell you. So the idea is the first step is you sort these from the smallest job to the biggest job. So the first job is just remember, we're not good at time and cost, but we are good at this is bigger than that. So you look at these six items and you sort them from smallest to biggest. Now, why is it so important to sort them? Because you don't want to compare when you're doing relative estimation, you don't want to compare your smallest thing to your biggest thing. You don't want to compare a chicken to an elephant for weight. How many chickens does an elephant weigh? That's just mind boggling. But how many giraffes does an elephant weigh? Now I can maybe get my brain around there, right? Maybe 10 uh, giraffes to an elephant, I don't know. So you can get closer. Um, so the first thing you do is sort. Then your smallest item gets a one. 
So whatever the smallest item on this list is a one. And then you estimate everything against that one. So is it twice as big, three, five, eight, 13, using those Fibonacci numbers. Um, and then what we do next is the exciting part. Now we do a job. Just get one of these jobs done and track how much did it cost and how long did it take? Every one of these would have a number. Let's say that this, I wonder if I have this written down anywhere. Yeah, okay. So let's say that this is what we come up with. And so you can see painting the family room was considered the smallest thing. It was a one. Adding a fence and replacing a driveway we thought were twos, threes, fives, eights, down to upgrading the kitchen for 13 points, right? This is what the guesses were. Well, now, if you just do one job, let's say you do this one, replace roof shingles, and it takes you, you know, a week and $7,000. Well, you can add all this up. One plus two plus two plus three, five, five, eight, 13. You add all that up. And now there's a ratio of $7,000 was a three. So you just take the ratio of that and you can multiply that against the total. And you've now got a forecast for the whole cost and for the whole time, even though we only did one job. Okay. So, and as you do this one job, you might realize, you know what? I think this is high. I think this might also be three. You know, you learn as you go. And so every time you do another job, you, uh, you update your ratio. So now you have eight points done and you've got 17,000 points spit, spent and you can update the math. So the idea is, again, I'm showing you all the answers here, but if you just built one of these items out, you could then use that to forecast the time and cost of all the others because they were relatively estimated using a Fibonacci scale. Um, so that's the idea here. The uh, animal one is a lot of fun because I then I, I let the teams pick what animal do you want to weigh first? Do you then they weigh it? And they've got to pick the riskiest animal. What animal are we least sure of? So you're like, the horse, how much does the horse weigh? And then you tell them and they're like, oh, okay. Then they readjust all their estimates and then they to give a new prediction. And at the end, we find out how many animals did they have to weigh before they got to like 90% accuracy on those weights, right? Um, so very, very fun relative estimation. Um, if you're interested, maybe I'll make a video of that at some point, but there you have it. So hopefully you found this 15 minute video on estimation useful. My name is Anthony Crane. And as always, uh, we'll see you next time. And we hope we find, you find our videos useful. And now I got to hit my stop sharing somewhere uh, there and stop recording. Bye-bye, everybody.